Let's talk about church yeah. attacks, attacks on churches, vandalism, uh, fires in some cases, uh, d- a tremendous amount of destruction of property. Uh, why was 2022? Is it just Roe v. Wade that was the biggest cause? Well, you know, we've been tracking it for, you know, um, and we've noticed that there's a lot of attacks actually even in 2020 and in 2021. Um, but it is true that the uptick, uh, we saw a big increase in that violence against churches and against pregnancy research centers in, uh, you know, right after um, the uh, the elite opinion about Dobbs, which eventually became what, what the Dobbs opinion was, overturning Roe v. Wade. And you saw, you know, Jane's Revenge, which is, you know, should be recognized as a, t- a domestic terroristic group, uh, saying, you know, if we're not safe, you're not safe. And that's and they spray painted that on sides of churches, on side of pregnancy resource centers. And it's just amazing that they would say, I mean, all the words that they would use. I mean, of course, because as we know, a child is not safe in any abortion facility. Um, and, and so abortion is the opposite of being safe. And yet, you know, they they want to be safe to have their abortions. And since they're not safe to have their abortions, uh, they're going to try to make a menace and, and and cause, you know, we've seen statues attacked, we've seen churches set on fire, and pregnancy resource centers attacked. And, you know, the thing is, we keep trying to bring this point up, is that, you know, crisis pregnancy... I, I, that's the old term. I got to keep remembering to say pregnancy research centers. <laughs> pregnancy research centers are, I mean, you know this, Joe. I mean, they are, they work so hard to raise money for diapers and for bi- uh, baby formula and clothes. I mean, yeah. they're scrapping together. They're not making, you know, a whole, whole bale of cash, right? Right. So the last thing that they would hope that they, the last thing that they would want to spend money on is, you know, security, you know, increasing, you know, getting cameras and having someone to kind of watch over the place every once in a while, you know, all that kind of stuff, security system, but that's all expensive. That's all money that goes mm-hmm. out of the care that they want to be able to provide to people. And so, yeah, no, we saw a definite uptick in violence in this um, last May after the leaked opinion. And then it didn't stop really, you yeah. know, and obviously with the Dobbs decision in, in June 24. So, you know, we've been tracking these and, um, you know, it was a year ago, uh, just about when, uh, it, cause we sent the letter to the justice department about the attacks on churches. That was, in the, we sent the letter last December, a year ago. So December, uh, 2021 and the justice department, you know, they finally responded like in late January. So, uh, you tell me, Joe, do you think they've done a lot? In, well, yeah, that was going to be my follow up question. Weeks? is it seems to me that there's been a lopsided uh, approach to justice in these circumstances. We saw in 2022 the FBI raids of pro-lifers, Mark Houck being um, among the, that crew. Um, but we haven't seen right. is Jane's revenge being hauled off to jail on television or, you know, the, right. uh, the leaked uh, body cam footage of them being arrested. We haven't seen that at all. So there does seem to be a lot of lopsided justice. I mean, tangentially related. Donald Trump got raided in 2022 for classified documents at Mar-a-Lago. Turns out today, Biden has classified documents at his old uh, think tank at P- Pennsylvania's university, uh, but no, no FBI raid in that case. So uh, how do we sit here and look back and say, all these churches, all these pregnancy resource centers attacked, nobody's answering for these crimes? So here's the thing. I mean, when you have, you know, the last two years we had Democrats that controlled not just the White House, obviously, but the uh, the House, and it was basically a divided Senate. They technically had, you know, the the lead there too. But even with all of that, right, the the Republicans were able to hold strong. And, and, And when you have government like this, you usually, if you focus on one narrow thing, you have the ability to make some change there. And so last year, that I thought was a horrible budget, of course, that was smushed through at the last second, right? But they, the Republicans were able to say, look, we want to make sure that the COVID uh, requirement mandate is gone for service members so that if someone wants to join the military, they're not going to have to do this anymore. I, it didn't help the people that were kicked out, okay? They, you only can get so much. And that's what happens with divided government kind of stuff or when the, you know, the, the other party has the White House. 
And so what we're hoping is in this new year that Republicans can try to be narrowly focused on something very influential. Now, this piece of legislation should be passed, as you said, it should be unanimous, okay? Here's a resolution. It, does, it focuses simply on the pregnancy research centers, and it gives actually some teeth to it. It basically it requires the inspector general to do a report tracking all this information. So it's not just a simple resolution. Sometimes Congress does these like simple resolutions, like, well, it's the sense of the Congress that this is a very bad thing. And I'm not da downplaying that. Like, sometimes you just, you got to go small. But this one actually puts some teeth to it. It actually, because every federal agency has an inspector general. And it's sort of like, if, if you watch police shows, it's like the internal affairs, right? Kind of, you know? And so they kind of look over the agency, make sure things are done right. So this legislation would tell the inspector general, we want to report on all these things that are going on here. And, and then if you were able to get this passed, which it will probably pass the House uh, tomorrow. So I'm, we're trying to rally people, though, anyway, because you know what? It, is it going to pass on a party line vote or can we get everyone? Like some people tell us, you know, yeah, yeah, I love what you're doing, but I live in a Democratic district. You know what? Call them anyway. You know, pressure them. Sometimes sometimes a political party says, gosh, you know what? This is just too hot. We're not going to touch this. We'll just pass it and rather than, you know, oppose it. And sometimes it can happen like that. But if there's enough public pressure, uh, you know, what, the, what might happen is that this might get attached to some, you know, all important must pass appropriation bill in the Senate. Maybe Senate Democrats will roll their eyes and go, oh, this is dumb, but fine, whatever. Whatever it takes, you know, I mean, sometimes that's the way it works in Washington, right? And so I want to try to urge, you know, your listeners to go to CatholicVote.org, read up on this story. Uh, thank you for mentioning it earlier. Uh, and call your congressman. We have a tool on our website, as you mentioned, where people can call their member of Congress and let them know, say, hey, vote for this. Like, who's against violence? I mean, there's, you know, there's a poll that was done on this. I mean, it should have been 100%, right? right. Are you, do you oppose violence at pregnancy research centers? It was like 82%. I'm like, who are the 18%? It's like, you know, come on. It's who are like they? so obvious. Who's against violence? Jeez, I would hope everyone. Hello. Yeah, exactly. But that's such a good point, Mr. Mercer. You know, uh, you know, even even for myself, sometimes I see things like that, and uh, I get so black-pilled about it, and I think, oh, you know, what, what, what good is it going to do? But we really have nothing to lose, right? I mean, how... Uh, you know, how much time is it going to take for you to go to CatholicVote.org and take a look at it and actually, you know, send something to your representative? That, that's such an important point. No, I think so. I mean, you know, like, the, you know, there's going to be a lot of bills that are going to be passed, you know, in, in this first month as Republicans take over the House, you know, and uh, some of those bills have no real chance at all. But, like, here's something that's a good opportunity for us to make noise about, um, you know, and, and here's something that we could say, you know, look, this is not going to become a new normal. We're not going to just sort of accept these attacks on our pregnancy research centers, you know. I, we call this a war on diapers. Amen. If you're Hold really opposed to people giving away free diapers. Right. I mean, Exactly. Absolutely Hold and that again, thought. Hold not, that thought. Legislation is where we left off at the last segment there, Joshua. Welcome back. And let me ask you about that, yeah. because we just saw, you know, apparently 15 times the charm to get a House speaker elected. <laughs> uh, historic. Histor first time ever in the history of our country to take 15 votes. I well, mean, it was like first time in over 100 years. Yeah, 15 I mean, votes. It, I don't think that's ever happened before. 15. Oh votes. no, 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 Joe, no, no, no. 1857 or something like that. It won 133 ballots. No, so, 133. Yes. Uh, oh yes. Yeah. So oh months. man. It took months. Oh yeah. So oh, it's, that was a lead up to the Civil War. So make uh, Congress great again. <laughs> What is your take? Is that the time when he pulled out the poker and they attacked each other <laughs> on the on the floor? This is like no, but like, that, it might have come to blows, you know. I mean, it's kind of funny though because like after a while, you know, some of the you know you had like some of the congressmen like get up there and say, "I want to vote for Donald John Trump," and then he had another one, yeah, who, who said, "There's a good, good conservative from uh, uh, Indiana named Jim Banks," and someone said his name, you know. And so my friend uh, who works here at Catholic Vote, Tom McCluskey, came up to him afterwards and said, hey, you know, I was, I, I, you know, this, <laughs> he says, I was running for Speaker of the House, too, Mr. Congressman, but uh, I, I guess you only got one more vote than me. You know? Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's rough. No, but it, it's, it, it, it's, it hasn't, you're right, though, it's, it's, it hasn't, it's been over, it was over 100 years where, you know, it kind of 
got, you know, got this many rounds. Now, and, a, uh, a lot of people, especially on the left, uh, you know, let's just say middle ground to left really did not like this. They did not like the idea that you would question the process and you wouldn't just give your rubber stamp and move on. And then a lot of people on the oh, conservative that's what they said. A lot of people on the conservative right were like, no, this is necessary. We're fighting for the soul of, of the GOP and and trying to get stuff done. So what is your take? Was this a useful exercise of of taxpayer dollars, or are we going to see just more of the same? Uh, I think it was a wonderful thing. I mean, first of all, you know, wasn't it President Biden said that democracy was on the ballot? Mm-hmm. And so what did we experience, you know, for these 15 rounds? So it was democracy in action, you know? Amen. The people were, you know, hashing it out. And they were saying, no, let's, we're just not going to roll over. I think the biggest thing that impressed upon them was that, as I mentioned before, that budget that got smushed through back in late December. It was just like this horrible bill. And it's like, we can't do this anymore because with these, with these, you know, you get like 20 congressmen in a, in a, in a it's not smoke filled room anymore, but it might as well be. And they craft together this like trillion dollar budget and then they bring it to the House floor and they say, hey, guess what? We're not going to give you that much time to read it. And you basically got to vote yes or no. Yeah. And guess what? You have no chance to amend this bill. You can't say, well, wait a minute now, let's take this piece out. Let's vote on that. But nope, take it or leave it. And so this new House uh, majority, uh, some of those guys are saying, we can't do this anymore. We got to change these rules. We got to give ourselves like 72 hours to look at a bill. If it's like a thousand pages long. And then also what we need to do is have the ability to amend legislation. You know, so when you see a bill and like, this is a terrible provision. And the whole point is, the establishment's like, nope, take it or leave it. And so that was really nice, actually, that these guys held the line and said, no, 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 we're going to demand you to do some reforms here. And no, no one likes to change things. You know, they, they prefer to no, this. We want you to just, to, you know, go along to get along. I was happy that some of these reformers said, you know something, when people elect Republicans to Washington, they expect them to fight for good government. They expect them to fight to, to have, uh, you know, not they don't expect us to go to Washington just to vote on these trillion dollar bills and not have any amendments on them or anything like that. So I think it was a very good process. It was kind of uh, unnerving and and unsettling because Washington likes things that are very predictable and very easy and good for them. But this was good for the country. I think so. And honestly, if you asked, if you could get Democrats to be honest and say, isn't it a good thing actually, honestly, that we're going to have the ability to amend legislation on the House floor for the first time since like 2016, I think it's a good thing for sure. You know, I think it's I think it's kind of hilarious in the sense that you've got like the squad, for instance, who really fought against their peers in the Democrat Party in order to get their agendas uh, pushed forward. And yet the same members of the squad are were squawking at the Freedom Caucus for trying to push forward all of these votes in order to get the, get certain changes uh, right. you know, on the books. I just kind of laughed and like, are you kidding? I mean, it's good for thee, but not for me, you know, that kind of thing. Well, and, and actually, Nancy Pelosi, when, he, when she went up for, uh, you know, re-election as speaker back a few years back, she didn't get a majority of the House members. There's a few Democrats that voted president, and she still won, but she didn't get you know, 218. She got like 216 or something like that because some of those squad members, I think it was, they're like, they weren't, eh, they kind of held her nose. Um, so, it, you know, but what's, I find it hilarious because uh, I, I was watching, it was like till one in the morning. I was getting so tired. And the Democratic leader, Hakeem Jeffries, he's the one that replaces Nancy Pelosi as the leader of the Democrats. He's not speaker, but he's the Democratic leader because they're the minority. And he got out there, he gave like a 30 minute campaign speech, and it was just obnoxious. And so then he finally gets done. And Kevin McCarthy takes the speaker down a long last. It's like one in the morning, you know. And he says, he warns Hakeem. He goes, you know, two years ago, I got 100% of Republicans in my conference to vote for me. And, then, you know, it took a 15 ballot this time. It was a little warning to the, to the Democratic leader. You got every Democrat to vote for you this time. But, you know, the shoes on the other foot, you be careful. Mm. It's, uh, Things get a little crazy in Washington, you know. So, speaking of the speaker, what do you think about the rules changes? Uh, now we have uh, an opportunity where a single member could uh, put forward a motion to have him removed. 
I could see that as a good thing, but I can also see it as a bad thing. It could be a uh, a weapon used to uh, to stall Congress. You know, where uh, they, if there's a bill, a particular bill that say the left does not want to see move forward, they could put up one motion after another after another just to kind of stall stall business and really harass the speaker and uh, the uh, the majority leadership. Yeah, I mean that's possible, but I mean, you know, the people who pushed for that rule change said this is what we ha- this is the Jefferson rule. You know, Thomas Jefferson was the one who really said we should do this. Where just one person could say, "Hey, get out of here. We don't like it." Now, obviously, you still need a majority to remove a speaker, but that was a rule that was in place in the House for over 200 years, and Nancy Pelosi was the one that removed it. So this is just like returning to the historical norm. I think that's fine. Um, you know, there's different ways you can um, gum up work and slow things down in the House. And mm-hmm. if it gets out of hand, then I would imagine the majority would say, "Let's do another rule change and tighten this up a little bit." Because the House is a very majoritarian institution. So if you get 218 people in that House to say, okay, this isn't working, maybe we were a little too flexible, maybe we allowed too many amendments, then they would just say, we got we to gotta tighten this ship up a little bit. So mm. um, I, it's not like the Senate where it's, you need that consensus, you need that 60 votes, it's harder. So you can whip things into shape. But it's tough. I mean, you have only 222 Republicans, 218 is the majority, that means – you lose like three, four guys, and you don't get a majority on that given thing. So don't be surprised if uh, the House of Representatives passes a few pieces of legislation or some amendments that you really can't stand because it's like, you know, it, it doesn't take you but a few, uh, you know, establishment or liberal Republicans to side with 200 and yeah. you know, 12 Democrats I mean, it to get was, something bad passed. Right, it was don't Republicans. That's, that's your warning. It was Josh Republicans that gave us the redefinition of marriage recently. So uh, thank you, Republicans, yeah, of course. For, oh, my for destroying the fabric of society. Really appreciate that. Hey, uh, let's so let's talk about investigations for a moment. Do you think that this Congress will move forward investigating some of the uh, the alleged criminal activity of Hunter Biden uh, and the Biden family? I mean, maybe, but the one I have to say, you know, like I, I want to be careful that I hope Republicans don't go down too far of a rabbit's hole on that one. The thing is, I, I've always said this is my rule. Like Benghazi, for example, a lot of Republicans are like, we've got him, Obama he, and, and Hillary. This is terrible. And the thing about scandals is that if they're complicated, uh, if the American people just go, I don't get it, I'm going to move on. And that's why actually uh, in p- politics, sex scandals, I'm not trying to be gross here, but like they're very simple to explain. And that's why they, they kind of break through to, to the to the average American, but like if it's a simple corruption thing, like Hunter Biden got paid, you know, X million or X whatever, and he gave it to his da- dad. If you can prove it, then maybe you know, as long as it's not too complicated. I, I wh- whether that's fair or not, I'm just telling you honestly. But the investigation that I'm looking forward to a little bit more though is in this rules package. They got a commitment from the House leadership that they're going to have a, what they call a church style committee, and that church actually refers to a congressman uh, from Idaho back in the seventies, Frank Church, who put these committees that investigated the, you know, the intelligence agencies, the Justice Watergate Department, scandal, FBI, that kind of stuff. Yeah, in the week of Watergate. So uh, we're looking forward to how it's now it's Republicans who are wanting to investigate these agencies, and they want to look at yeah. you know this violence stuff. You know, they were um, Church was corruption and all that kind of Church stuff. was trying to hold the CIA accountable because they were spying domestically on Americans, right. which they're not allowed to do. That's illegal, and they were doing right. that. And so he's like, "We need to have some accountability here," and he wants to see that that style of uh, oversight still exists. Which uh, you know brings us to what about uh, committee uh, chairs that are being selected right now? Jim Jordan looks like he's going to be sitting in the seat that gets to oversee what government agencies are doing and not doing. Yeah, no, I'm very excited to see him as chairman of the House Judiciary Committee. Uh, It it was like a position he was made for. He's going to be that kind of dogged prosecutor type who's just going to go after these guys. I'm very much looking forward to that. Uh, I mean, on other things like uh, House Armed Services Committee, it's the military kind of stuff. Dan Crenshaw uh, he's the guy everyone sees on TV, and he looks really. He's got the patch over his eye because he lost it in the war. He looks very tough, like a, you know. He's just, but uh, honestly, he's he's super supportive of going to war just about everywhere. And I was happy actually to see that he lost Amen. his bid to be yeah. chairman. And in fact, we got uh, a different uh, guy, Mark Green, 
who the Democrats had opposed to be in charge of the Department of Army back in the day because uh, they thought he was too conservative. Now he's the chairman of the Armed Services Committee. So, you know, this is this is looking like a good majority that I think might actually get some things done. But I, I, I've told people, you know, you've got a very slim majority. Uh, like I said, only 222 to 2, you know, uh, 13 or so. So don't expect a whole lot to get ha- at 212, I should say, with the vacancy. But uh, don't expect it a lot, but uh, we're going to start to see, hopefully, some incremental reforms. And like you say, um, I think the big uh, the big news here will be watching these committee hearings, these investigations. Mm. Um, I hope that I, I hope investigating the, the church violence and the, yeah. the violence against pregnancy research centers will be issue number one for us. And I hope the new Congress will take it seriously. All right, make sure you're on the loop. You can sign up at CatholicVote.org. Their daily email that keeps you informed. It's a really great. Uh, email I receive every single day. Go to catholicvote.org. Joshua Mercer, God bless you. God love you. Thank you again. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having us. Coming up after the break, if you can join us, we've got the game show plus 2023 resolutions, the after show, and much, much more. GRNonline.com forward slash CDT.